This is the greatest hockey player to ever live. And this is him sitting on the bench, watching five Canadian shooters fail to score against Dominic Hasek in a shootout. With the stakes higher than ever, this unexpected decision left hockey fans across the nation stunned. How did the coaching staff conclude that there were five shooters more deserving than the great one on the world's biggest stage? From the controversial roster decisions that shaped the team, to the ease of those round-robin games that made it seem like Canada was untouchable, to a disastrous ending, this is a story of the tournament that still haunts Canadians today. Let's dive into how Canada's Olympic dream slipped away in 1998. This tournament was a huge deal. It was the first time in history that NHL players were going to participate in Olympic hockey, and the first and only time for Wayne Gretzky. The NHL saw the impact Olympic participation had on the NBA at the 92 games in Barcelona, and were hoping to grow the game internationally. Canada was coming off an embarrassing loss to the Americans at the 96 World Cup, and this was their chance at redemption. People expect nothing but a first place finish. Anything else will be unacceptable, stated Wayne Gretzky. And he was right. Nothing other than a gold is acceptable when you can ice a roster with Wayne Gretzky, Eric Lindros, Steve Eiserman, Ray Bork, Chris Pronger, and Patrick Waugh. Oh, and Martin Brodeur was the backup goalie. The pressure was on Hockey Canada to fill out the rest of the roster, and they chose Flyers GM Bobby Clark to assemble the team. This is when things went wrong. Instead of choosing the best players and trusting them to adapt, Canada filled out the margins of their roster with role players. There were many questionable decisions, mainly the inclusion of Rob Zemuner. He was a defensive forward for the Tampa Bay Lightning. Emphasis on the defensive because he only scored 26 points the Olympic season. Trevor Linden, heart and soul player for the Canucks, made the cut. He's a good player with a history of stepping up in big moments, but his game lacked dynamism and there were more skilled and deserving options that were overlooked. Shane Corson made the cut, a guy that only scored more than 60 points once in his career. Keith Primo, decent player, but also not one of the top scoring Canadians of his era. So who did the Canadians leave at home? Ron Francis, the second highest scoring Canadian in 97-98. Adam Oates, the fifth highest scoring Canadian. Pierre Turgeon, whose 68 points in 60 games ranked him second in points per game. And Scott Niedermeyer, the highest scoring Canadian defenseman. To make matters worse, Mario Lemieux was forced to retire due to wear and tear on his body. This is from injuries and radiation treatment for Hodgkin's lymphoma. Another Canadian superstar, Paul Correa, was originally named to the roster, but he couldn't attend due to his many concussions. This one at the hands of Gary Suter. The absence of Korea was disappointing to hockey fans in Japan. This was due to his Japanese heritage. To quickly recap, five of Canada's highest scoring forwards were left at home. The second mistake made by Team Canada was choosing 24-year-old Eric Lindros as captain. And that's not just me saying it. Head coach Mark Crawford later stated, I'd say, if you had to do it again, you'd probably make a different choice. I can tell you this though, it didn't matter that Wayne was not the captain. Wayne was the leader. He was the guy everybody gravitated to. Bobby Clark is the one to blame for this. He was the one that chose his own player, a Philadelphia Flyer, to be the captain of this team. Don't get me wrong, Lindros was a dominant player at the time, but this was an avoidable controversy, and Crawford's comment goes to show how players overlooked Lindros. He didn't have the same aura as Gretzky. This combined with the shootout omission, kind of odd how Hockey Canada treated their greatest player. And he was still a great player. He was the highest scoring Canadian that season. Before flying out to Japan, Gretzky stated, It would be nice to be able to put a gold medal beside my Stanley Cup. A fairy tale finish to a fairy tale career, but it just wasn't meant to be. If you guys are enjoying this video so far, please subscribe. I'm trying to get to 10,000 and I can do it with your help. Thank you. Canada's original plan was to ice two scoring lines, one checking line and an energy line, but as we saw earlier, injuries to key players can throw a wrench in even the best constructed plans. Crawford's strategy was to play one checking player and two skilled guys on each line. Canada won the first game against Belarus 5-0 on the back of Eric Lindros, who scored two goals. Theo Fleury stated, Eric's here. He's ready to play and it's too bad for the other teams. Too bad for Canada as well that these were the only two goals of the tournament for Eric Lindros. Belarus is not exactly grade A competition, but Canada's second opponent was. The Swedes. They were stacked. They had Nicholas Lidstrom, Daniel Alfredson, Peter Forsberg, and Matt Sandin. But they were no match for Canadian hero Joel Neuendijk, whose three points propelled Canada to a 3-2 victory. With seven seconds left in the second, he set up Rob Blake off the rush for a game winner. 
Neuendijk was so impressive in this game that Mark Crawford stated his game has returned to the level it was in 1988, when he became only the second NHL rookie to score 50 goals. The final round robin game was the big one. First place in the group was still up for grabs, but the Canadians had their intentions set on revenge. They were playing the United States, and before the game, Gretzky stated, They like knocking us off. They like to beat us, and we have to gain the same attitude towards them. Canada came out swinging, and the much maligned Rob Zemuner opened the scoring in the first period. Keith Primo stepped up with two goals. Joe Sakic added a goal and two assists. Canada won 4-1, but this was Patrick Waugh's night. Surprisingly, this was the first and only time in his career that he represented Canada, not even at the junior level. He made 30 saves, and U.S. coach Ron Wilson remarked, Patrick Waugh is generally regarded around the league as one of the best big-time goaltenders ever, and he had a big-time effort today. This could be a tournament where a goaltender can make all the difference in the world. Excellent foreshadowing. Canada clinched first place in the group to set up a date in the quarters against the glorious nation of Kazakhstan. The vibes around the team were great. Gretzky stated, It's as much fun as I've ever had in hockey. You get on the ice and it's a whole different game. Unfortunately, the fun didn't last long. Before their game against the Czechs, the Canadians had to get through Kazakhstan, who put up a valiant effort. It was a one-goal game until Wayne Gretzky put the team on his back. First, he set up Brendan Shanahan for his first of the tournament. And not even a minute later, he set up Steve Eiserman for this one-timer. The Canadians won 4-1 and Gretzky stated, We were the superior team. We kept our focus. We kept playing our disciplined, defensive system. Well, if they were going to have any hope of defeating Dominic Hasek and the Czechs, they were going to have to go on the offensive. Hasek was in his prime, in the midst of winning back-to-back heart -back trophies. Not Vezinas, heart trophies. He was the rare goalie that you don't have a book for. There is no game plan. All you can do is hope for the best. Half the Czech players weren't even from the NHL. They knew they couldn't match Canada line for line, so they played a risk-averse, defense-first game. Theo Fleury stated, We should have played the game on a soccer field because that's how the game was played. They didn't even come into our zone after they went up 1-0. It wasn't hockey. It was awful. The Czechs parked the bus and a Yuri Slager goal had them 10 minutes away from the gold medal game. However, Trevor Linden forced overtime with just over a minute remaining after a nice setup by Eric Lindros. Canada was back in it. They'd forced overtime but again Hasek was up to the challenge. Canada dominated in the OT period but this game was destined for a shootout. The Czechs had the Canadians exactly where they wanted them. This was seven years before the shootout was introduced in the NHL, but it existed in Europe and the international game for decades. Mark Crawford stated, You could just tell they were waiting to get to the shootout. They weren't afraid of it like we were. Of course they weren't afraid. They had Dominic Hasek in net. They also didn't face the same pressure the Canadians did. The entire nation expected gold. The Czechs were kind of just happy to be there. Shanahan even stated, We didn't want to get into a shootout. Dominic's pretty quick. Joe Sakic missed this game due to a knee injury, but before the shootout, he tried to relay a message to Mark Crawford on how to beat Hasek. But it was in vain. The coaches had already removed their headsets. Maybe he was going to tell him to send Gretzky out, because this is a list of shooters. Fleury, Bork, Neuendijk, Lindros, Shanahan. Canada's fate was sealed after the very first round. Theo Fleury came in with speed and missed. Right after him went Robert Reichel for the Czechs, who went post and in on Patrick Waugh. Shanahan had Canada's last chance but was denied against Hasek in round 5. The Czechs had done it. They had completed one of the greatest upsets in hockey history. Shanahan later stated, You feel terrible when you don't score. You feel like you let your country down, let your teammates down. You just want to stick your head in the ground. This was a national embarrassment. Even though Canada won 15 gold medals at the Olympic Games, this was the one that got away. Imagine yourself in this moment, in Gretzky skates. You're the NHL's all-time leading scorer and you just watch your teammates go 0-5 in the shootout. Now, it's time to answer the question in the title. Bob Ganey, assistant GM of Team Canada stated, I can tell you that I coached in an all-star game where I had Gretzky and Brett Hall on my team. We had some kind of penalty shot competition and neither of them wanted to shoot. Ganey wasn't surprised that Gretzky wasn't picked. He's arguing that Gretzky doesn't have an affinity for these shootouts, but he's referring to a mean-nothing all-star event, not a do-or-die shootout at the Olympics. 
By analyzing the selected shooters, we get a better understanding of why Gretzky was left on the bench. The simple answer is that Canada had five options they thought were more likely to score. This lineup card was not a heat of the moment decision. It was calculated. It was decided by the coaching staff pre-game in the event of a shootout. First off, they didn't feel that Gretzky was a goal scorer anymore. And there's some truth to that. Even though he was Canada's leading scorer in the NHL, he only scored 23 goals that season. He hadn't scored 30 in four years. This wasn't the 80s anymore when he was scoring 80 to 90 goals a season. This was reflected in his play at the tournament. He had four assists, but zero goals. Now let's analyze the five shooters chosen ahead of Gretzky. Theo Fleury had a goal at this tournament. He was a very skilled diminutive forward who still had a couple of 30 goal seasons in him. A fine pick and he actually came close to scoring. He had the right idea of coming in with speed, but Hashik got a piece of it. Bork is the pick that was most questionable. The defenseman was prolific at NHL All-Star accuracy competitions. And this is why he was picked. Again, this is not an All-Star game and Bork was denied by Hashik's shoulder. Neuendijk was one of the best Canadian forwards of the tournament, so no surprise there. Lindros was the captain. Of course he was going to shoot. And Shanahan had just come off a 46-goal season. Bork is the one you look at and say, Gretzky could have taken his spot. Crawford stated, I think he's proven throughout the years to be great on breakaways. This is an interesting statement. Do you think or do you know? Do you have some statistic to back this up? Also, there was a belief amongst Team Canada that Gretzky wasn't good on breakaways. I wonder how they came to this conclusion. Crawford further stated, I talked to both our goalies and they said when the ice is heavy after a third period and in overtime, you've got to have guys who have the ability to pick corners and have the strength to make the shot. We did consider Wayne. There are so many good shooters on our team. And that pretty much answers the question. Crawford didn't feel that Gretzky was a shooter anymore. They wanted guys that could wire the puck. They wanted all of their players to shoot, not deke. It was a calculated strategy. They truly believed that it would be difficult to deke on ice that wasn't fresh. Well, they didn't relay this message to the shooters because Neuendijk, Lindros, and Shanahan all tried to deke. I guess they could be forgiven because Canada didn't have experience in shootouts. But still, Canadian hockey fans are never going to forget this image. Their greatest player of all time watching helplessly as his Olympic dream slips away. Let's start off by giving the Czechs their flowers. They had a game plan and they stuck to it. Mark Recchi stated, They didn't get into any odd man situations. They collapsed right down into the defensive zone. We had trouble getting shots through. Surprisingly, the Canadians were outshot by one when the dust settled. Matter of fact, the Czechs were playing for a shootout. They just focused on tying up Canadian forwards and letting Hashik take care of the rest. Martin Ruchinski stated, We wanted to stay close the whole game and if we got to a shootout, fine. Also, European hockey had grown and closed the gap on the Canadians. This was evidenced by the fact that the Czechs, Russians, and Finns found themselves on the podium. Canada didn't do themselves any favor with their roster selection. I discussed this earlier, but I can't help but think they would have won this tournament if Mario Lemieux had played. Also, losing Sakic to a knee injury only compounded their issues, and Korea would have 100% shot in the shootout. Bobby Clark should shoulder some of the blame. His strategy of building the team with two scoring lines, a checking line, and an energy line failed. This wasn't the NHL, and in 2010 and 2014, Canada won by choosing the best players and having them adapt to different roles. Clark also didn't consider the fact that the game was being played on European-sized rinks. He tried to build a gritty, checking, in-your-face team built on North American principles, but this was short-sighted. It was his responsibility to choose the best hockey players, trust them to adapt, and he failed miserably in this regard. It didn't help that the defense was unable to connect with the forwards and generate more offense. Desjardins, Pronger, Stevens all combined for zero points. Patrick Waugh had more points. He had an assist. Scott Niedermeyer should have been on this team. At the very least, his smooth skating ability would have helped the team in transition. Finally, the team's tactics were outdated. Over and over, Canada would reach the red line with speed, only to dump the puck into a corner to chase it. Their game was built around toughness, forecheck, grit. They had 15 extra feet of space, and instead of utilizing it with their skill, they treated it like a beer league game. The Czechs recognized this. They would beat the Canadians to the puck in the corner and break it out before they could get a cycle going. The Canadians were completely unable to adapt and the Czechs used their experience on the bigger ice to complete the upset. That's all I have for this video. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe. I'm trying to get to 10,000, and I can do it with your help. Thank you.